Good morning. Uh, so that's me. The photo gallery is for my wonderful young collaborators. There are some others who I will call out as, as the work shows up. This is Abhishek Arora, current student, uh, uh, graduating this summer, ex student uh, in engineering, uh, works for artificial intelligence at AMD, the chip company, mathematician, often postdoc. Molecular dynamicist, ex student, uh, Microsoft AI at this point, and Salesforce. You see, regular intelligence doesn't cut it anymore, it has to be artificial. <laughs> okay, I'm going to speak about uh, dynamic supply and defect. So, Mostly the emphasis will be on plasticity. So what does plasticity do for you? There are defects uh, and what it does is steel is pretty strong. You know this. Uh, this is the kind of thing that these, the motion of defects allows you to do okay. without breaking the material. And uh, okay. So there are knots, right? You know where I got that picture, which lab I got that picture from. But, uh, anyway, uh, Adriana Garoni did a fantastic job yesterday of setting up what dislocations are. Uh, so I will uh, uh, do some cartoon explanations uh, on that. So, so think that, uh, suppose you have a block uh, where atoms are all connected, there is a certain topology and, and that's all preserved and elastic deformation is when you've not broken any of those connections, okay? So, small deformations from the ground state. But because of the fact that there is symmetry in the lattice uh, and therefore you can make deformations, non-trivial deformations, not rigid ones, which can preserve the Lattice, the atomic, uh, the, the, the positions of the lattice with changes in the atomic positions, uh, you can get into, if you, if, you, if you put sufficient load, you can get into situations where, you know, you might have on, on about, that's called a slip plane, you know, one of these rows might slip out of registry. When you put load, and when you take the loads off, it will actually stay there. So that's called... Plastic deformation. Plastic, one way of thinking about plastic deformation at the microscopic level is that the, the bonding topology changes. Okay. The nearest neighbors change of atoms. And, and so uh, this is, you, you're supposed to think of, uh, there's a line going down to the plane of the screen there, and that's called the dislocation line defect. Here it is straight. And uh, in terms of describing it, you would say this is a slip plane and this, that line would be the boundary between slipped and unslipped regions on the slip plane, okay? So what that means is that, see, for all of these places, the atoms have shifted by one atomic distance, but here there's only elastic deformation. So this is what you mean by slip. Uh, so that's one thing, right? And the second thing is you you understand right away when you see this sort of a picture that uh, stress in a slipped body does not depend upon the total deformation uh, because why? Because you see once slip has happened, you, you, you do this. This is the total deformation from this reference configuration. But clearly, you know, atoms don't care about where I came from. It's from the here and the now of whatever I'm seeing in, you know, interatomic potential. So that's what it is. So this, these guys see only this neighborhood. So if you look at this point here, it doesn't generate stress from that deformation. It generates stress from the <coughs> So that's why when you do plasticity, you know, microscopy, you know, the F, F is not the same as FE. There is something that else is that's going on. Okay, so that's that. Now, uh, <clears throat> just from the definition that I said, right, that the dislocation line is the boundary on the slip plane between slipped and unslipped regions. If you milk this definition just by words, you will see that in two dimensions, such a line cannot end within the body. It has to be a closed loop or it has to go from a boundary to boundary. 
It will turn out that the dislocation will also be characterized by a curl of a field. And the curl is divergence free. So if you have the curl localized in the tube, let's say, you just play with the divergence theorem and you'll see that, you know, this guy cannot end in the material. If it's a non-trivial tube concentrated with the curl, better come out from the other side, otherwise the charge has to be zero. <laughs> this is just playing around with stuff. You know that. Okay, so plasticity is about motion of dislocations, all right? And you can also understand that if you have a dislocation like this, the bonds are messed up here that wherever the line is, so it's going to produce stress. And in 2D, it's like a one over R, so it produces substantial stress, okay? Keep that in mind too. And because of that one over R field, it turns out that, uh, um, uh, you know, it just in terms of thinking in terms of energy and minimizing as much energy as you can, not global minimizers. When you nucleate a dislocation, now, okay, so when you nucleate a dislocation, you never nucleate really one single one. It's always a dipole or a loop. Because you see, with, uh, the messing around then becomes very localized for a loop. And so you put out a dipole and then the dipole moves out to produce plastic deformation. This also, for the more mathematically oriented, which is this crowd, you can see this as uh, the energies came out as mod d squared, right? The d was the charge. So the Werner's vector has to be conserved. So you have a one charge. So, you know, you can break it into half and half. That still adds up to one. So half squared is one fourth plus a one fourth is a half energetically. It's always easy <coughs> to split the guy up. So that is also another way you can see why you would want a dipole or a loop. Okay, so that's that's at the single level. And a screw dis there's something else called a screw dislocation. The edge is Taylor, Orman, Polanyi. Actually, the dislocation was discovered before it was observed. It's one of the theoretical discovery, okay? The screw dislocation is even more screwy. I mean, it's like the Burgers came. It's the same Burgers, Jan Burgers of the Burgers equation. His brother was a crystallographer, so he probably talked to his brother and feel. That's, that's an interesting character, the screw dislocation. And the best way I can describe the screw dislocation to you is you go to a parking ramp, and you're confused which floor you are on. That's the screw dislocation, okay? I mean, so think of a screw, you have lattice planes and you cut the planes and then you add, I mean, you connect one guy to the other and it's, that's why it's called a screw. Okay, that also happens, we'll talk about the screw dislocation. Um, so th those are individual dislocations. This is what, so if you look under a TEM, uh, they are loops, I said, you know, loops, but, and they interact by, the, by stresses. So one guy is over there, that fellow produces a one into D, let's say, one over our stress field. And then that stress is what moves this thing around and the applied stress. So it's a major collective thing. And the other thing is for macroscopic plasticity, nucleation is not an issue, okay? It's only when you're doing nanoscale stuff or thin films, nucleation is. A, is a well annealed material is like 10 to the power eight per meter square lines. So these are lines. Think about 10 to the power 8, right? One meter square is like this. There are 10 to the power 8 lines going through that. And that's well annealed. You won't even see it under anything. So, so nucleation is not an issue. There are a bunch of dislocations and it's the interaction and the motion that's important, okay? Uh, so, okay, so, so these are loops. Uh, here, what you're seeing is this is of HC copper, this is high conductivity copper. This is under fatigue loading. Fatigue is, you know, you, you just keep doing this, meaning to and fro, so some, some sort of repetitive loading. And in that, the lines go through the plane. Here, the lines are going through the plane of the paper, and they pattern like this, okay? So here, it's the well annealed stuff, like I said. And they'll all, they'll all concentrate on these, on these uh, boundaries. And these are cells, these are not grain boundaries. These are cells within grains, okay? So if you, you want a mathematical theory, okay, this is what you have to do. Okay? So, so something where the dislocation density will go from 10 to the power eight to 10 to the power 15. 
in a bounded. So th th this, this is what you need to produce. Obviously, this is a complicated thing that we're talking about. And at low strains, you also they produce fantastic patterns. Um, so okay, so that's 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 the bit about about uh, this stuff. So that's a physical bit. That's as much as I'm going to say. Uh, so a good way to think about what a dislocation <coughs> is, at least once you start to think about material. For me, is to think that it's like a discontinuity within a discontinuity. So what do I mean by that? See, think of a surface here. The displacement is discontinuous. Okay, this is this is still okay. What's really bad is now that discontinuity itself becomes discontinuous. It terminates along this line. Okay, that's the dislocation line. So mathematically, think of it that way. Um, all right. So a, a construction which is good to keep in mind is the following. Okay. So suppose this is the disk. It includes this C is the core. So I tell you, I give you on omega minus C, I give you a C1 field, a matrix field. I tell you, uh, and this matrix field is curl free. I ask you to characterize the possible discontinuities in a vector field that you can construct, that is, e whose gradient is equal to this guy A um, in a suitable domain. Obviously, fine. so what's the answer? It's all simple stuff. I can only do simple math. So, so, so what you do is you you make a cut. Uh, so that's a non-simply connected domain. You make a cut, any cut, any s from this boundary to that, so that the remaining bit becomes simply connected. Then, of course, you can it's curl free, so you can construct uh, a y on any omega minus s. So it's utterly non-unique. And, uh, and and so what uh, what's the character so I said characterize the discontinuity so the jump in this displacement field that you construct will be equal to this vi which is a constant no matter what the cut no matter what the cut this is going to be a constant on any s and that constant is characterized by you just do a line integral of this given field a on a closed loop okay this is called the Borders vector. I mean, it, okay, so yeah, good enough. This is the Borders vector, okay? So these kind, I said non unique layers, all right? So these layers are not, I'm not making this up, okay? So this is a calculation we got on the cover page of <coughs> Journal of Chemical Theory and Computation. So these kinds of ideas. So what it is, is, you know, you, the gay burn potential, uh, this is with Jerry and Shoptoshi. So uh, you simulate uh, pneumatics. Of course, you know, the potential has head tail symmetry built into it. These are the guys. And, and what lamps is this molecular simulation simulator? It spits out, basically, um, it's not even a vector field. It essentially puts out these messages and assigns randomly some orientation to that, right? So they are arrows. They don't come out as a line. So what do you have to do? I mean, in, within our setting, we are going to actually work with the vector field. All right. So the algorithm that we do is you assign a vector field to one of these guys arbitrarily. And then you play the exact game that is generally it'll be how you figure out charges, right? So you go to nearest neighbors and you assign the next arrow consistent with what you've done. And if one guy has been assigned an arrow, you never reorient it. And if there are defects, this is how you go and cover all the messages. And if there is a defect, if there's a half defect, there must be a layer, okay? And then you can color the layers. The yellows are the layers where you figure out that n, one, n minus n, the nearest neighbors is close to two, the magnitude. These are the colors. I told you, okay. So this is actually a mess. This is like uh, 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 lamps delivered uh, configuration with those, and then we reorient that, define the vector field, and you and you get these layers. They are non-unique, but their terminations are unique. Okay, we're getting a little bit here or there, but but this is that's a calculation. And this algorithm also, what it does is if you, it, 
it has a topological character. You, you can imagine if you think about it a little bit. So even, even if you supply a configuration where you've actually taken the core out, you take all of this stuff out, play, run the same algorithm, there's a half defect in there, it'll pull out the layer. It has to. Okay. So so this is I'm not, not just playing games here. If you, you can make this happen, realize it. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> So I'll tell you a little bit about stress fields for dislocations and I say, okay, so the, these classical books will not uh, present it exactly this way, but this is the main, you can reverse engineer it, right? So suppose the question is like this, you have a disk uh, as a center, you, 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 you have a surface S and you say, um, uh, that's the Dirichlet integral, theta is a scalar field, that theta squared, solve the bread theta on omega minus s uh, subject to this jump, a fixed jump on this s, like we decided from the kinematics. And the boundary conditions are, okay, so this is the jump we specified, and uh, we call it the traction, right? The Neumann, I mean, the normal gradient is specified on the jump, and outside, this is not important, I mean, you know, the Neumann, so zero, zero Neumann, no forces on this guy. So the picture you should associate with this is, if you like pneumatics, think of theta as the angle. Uh, if you like uh, dislocations like me, then think of this as the anti-plane problem, okay? Theta is the anti-plane displacement as a function of xy. So, so what's going to happen here? So uh, you realize directly, be just because of this boundary condition, that uh, if I integrate, grad theta has to blow up like one over r. You don't have to do a calculation. This is clear, just from this boundary condition, because uh, if I integrate grad theta smaller and smaller, radii, you know, r d theta, grad theta has to be pull out something finite, grad theta better go like one over r. Yeah, no way you can do anything else. This is in 2D, right? Okay, so one over R. It's linear elasticity, energy density is one over R square. You integrate it on a finite domain, it, uh, you know, R d, R d theta, R square, the log R problem. And even on bounded domains, this fellow has infinite energy. This is a problem. This is a serious problem. Okay. So it's not, it has the, you should, saw a lot of log R over R showing up. Not the big R, that's the problem. It's the small R, that's the problem. Okay, so uh, so obviously you can't do much with that. Uh, so one way to think about it is, and it's, at least for me, it's physical. Uh, you see, I mean, at the microscopic level, these things are not singular. There is a spacing. There is a spacing between atomic layers over which slip happens. Even in the matrix I showed you, right? There is a spacing. So, uh, so what you do, is you take this disk, and where S was there, think about this construction, this, this will help. Uh, so, um, what you don't quite regularize just at the level of theta, I mean, you have to pull out some topological characteristics. So, so, so what you do is you introduce another vector field, say lambda, and let me just tell you what that is, how you, you're supposed to think of it right now is along that S guy, you take the jump from the boundary conditions, you divide it, so essentially you, you hook up a vector field that more or less gets you that jump, right? It's more fancy, it's the singular part of the, the theta that you're uh, constructing something for that, right? So that guy, you put it on the N, that's the vector, and what is this function G of T? The T is the, Unbold t is the coordinate along this x-axis, so tangential starting, uh, and this is the unit vector. So g of t is takes a value one here, zero there, transitions from one to zero there. Okay. So if I take a vector field like this, you right away realize that this doesn't have a tangential component, right? Only has a normal component. So so this fellow has a curl, and the curl is all localized here. Because 
curl is just uh, in this particular case the normal component derivative in the tangential direction, tangential component derivative in the normal direction. So that's that. And if you integrate this fellow just by construction, you up on any particular circuit, <coughs> circuit in the core, you're going to pick this up. So that's good. And now the claim is that in the original problem, where there was grad theta, you go stick in this object. Okay. Now you you now you have two fields put in. So I don't want to call the same thing theta. So theta d. Everything is for me. There's nothing singular. Really, I mean. Everything will be integral here. So grad theta minus lambda, you call this guy, and then you solve, you are solving div grad theta. Now you solve div E equals zero in this. And the claim is that uh, um, this will, if, if you let now L go to zero, so in the following, this L will become epsilon times this length. This is the fundamental length. Epsilon is a non-dimensional parameter that will take L to zero. So, okay, you take L to zero because the core is still has some width. This is not going to blow up the energy. Okay. And when you take both of them to zero, th these are difficult limits. And, but, but intuitively, I mean, the heuristic argument is there that this will actually recover uh, the Volterra formulation in those limits, provided one can do that rigorously. But, but the overall scheme is there. The formal scheme. Okay, that's the way. So a physicist would call this minimal dis replacement and gauge theories. You know, so gauge theories. You have a, uh, you make the translational symmetry local, and that's what's going on here. Okay, very good. So this is the important slide. I want to slowly go through this, and you get this then more or less. You understand what I'm going to say. So, you, we're going to develop a dynamical model, right? And let's focus on the 2D case. Just the 2D. So, you have a 2D domain, XY. And uh, when you're doing screw dislocations, uh, then, okay, so there is going to be like this is the out of plane displacement, right? XY, T. This is the, the out of plane. Displacement U3. And if you're doing pneumatics, this is the angle from some axis. You introduce this another field, the vector field lambda that was showing up. So that's that. This is in U1 and U2. You take a curl of this. That's got the curl of that vector field is going, this is uh, going to be the, this, we'll call this the dislocation density. This is the plastic distortion. When you're doing the screw dislocation, you know, uh, it'll actually be second order tensors with the E3 floating around, but you can forget about it. I mean, it doesn't really affect much of the calculation. Physically, of course. Very good. So this, this, is the, this is the kinematic setting, more or less. Lambda and theta are the fields you want to solve. So with that minimum, you know, that replacement that I said, so you define a quantity called the elastic distortion, which will be grad theta minus lambda. Okay. And then uh, it, that's elastic. This, this is defined as elastic distortion. And now what you do is this is mechanical equilibrium, force balances, right? So theta tt, so and there should be a row there too. Mass density is important. But otherwise, if it's equilibrium, then mu is the modulus. And divergence of mu e equals zero, ue is this. And, and, and uh, okay. And then, so these are the two guys. And then, what is the evolution? I mean, how, how are we going to talk about the evolution of lambda? I'm not going to say that this is just because I knew the energy, I know everything about the evolution. The energy is important. But there is a small thing that, that you want to incorporate. And it's a natural one. I mean, just like you do mass balance, right? Uh, con conservation of mass, conservation of linear momentum. Here, because it's a curl, this guy has a topological character set. So if you take localized guys, you know, you make loops, you're going to pick out a burger's vector, right? And that's really a charge you can associate with this sort of a line quantity, okay? 
So because this is a curve, you want to do fancy differential geometry, then, then you know, this is a two form really. So this is an object, unlike linear momentum, mass, linear momentum is a vector value three form. Mass is a three form. Yeah, there are volume densities. This guy is an aerial density, it's per unit area. The line going per unit area, right? So it me measures charges, the content, the charge content of all lines passing through an area. And this statement over here is simply a localization of the statement that the rate of change of the charge content of these lines within an area, all the lines threading this area, the rate of change is equal to what comes in minus what goes out. And what comes in minus what goes out, that flux, it's a nice high school geometric argument, but it's very, very nice. It really that's not high school, maybe first year. You have to know some vector calculus, fool around with that. Uh, it, 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 you have said that the lines have a velocity field. Okay? So that velocity field is what uh, moves these lines around. So the flux will be given by B cross V. And there will be a curl over here. So this more or less, uh, more or less implies that this is the evolution for lambda. This is like, you know, this guy is a curl. There's a curl. You peel off the curl. This is like when you do burgers in Hamilton Jacobi form. This is the system analog of that business going on over here. Okay, so elastic distortion, mechanical equilibrium. This is the evolution equation. Before I put in any constitutive assumption, this is almost a tautological statement. Before I say what V is. The you know, rate of change is whatever comes in minus whatever goes out. You can't argue with me on that. This we have to agree on. Okay, good enough. And then you introduce an energy density. In the dislocation case, you will say, so this is like your you know, the regular part, meaning this is an integrable object. If you had that sort of a layer and if you went even to the limit, this is all good. So this is the elastic part. I, I'll, I'll explain to you how this regular, why you need that core energy. This is the core part. It's curl lambda, okay? Because it, you don't want to do grad lambda. Grad lambda would kill you because, you know, the, there's a huge gradient in the transverse direction to the layer. Curl doesn't see that if lambda is a vector in the normal direction. So you want to just penalize the core, and that's the longitudinal gradient of the transverse vector field. So that's that. And there is a, this fellow, this is a, a double well or a periodic guy, which keeps lambda in the right wells, and I'll, I'll show you a construction of what, what to do. So if, suppose this is, the, this is the typical energy density for the dislocation case. You know, I, 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 I've been brought up in continuum mechanics. So you do the kinematics separately, energy density, then you put it into Coleman null type thermodynamics, but a little bit more in the local sense, a uh, non-local situation, because your evolution equations are not local. So, so what you say is this thermodynamics bit is simply this statement, that whatever power you are putting into the body, minus the rate of change of the free energy, minus the rate of change of kinetic energy, better be non-negative. Okay. Otherwise, you would be producing energy, which would be great if we could do this from nothing, but doesn't quite happen. All right, so you, you play that game, and that tells you that the, dri oh, the driving, oh, what did I do? The driving force for this velocity, which was tautological at this point, come down to me. What that means is, if you say that, uh, this velocity is taken by as, 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 okay, so forget about this part over here. Just think of this as a constant dimensionally required. If you take it to be along this vector field, then that uh, uh, energy supply, power supplied minus rate of change of free energy minus rate of change of kinetic energy is always going to be non negative. This we know. Okay. This is a standard game that gets played. Okay, so once you, I, now, now you see this part is not natural, but I stuck it in for a reason. You will see why I did that. So this would be a constant over here, okay? Uh, okay, so then if you get this V, you plug it into this guy, 
And the evolution for lambda then becomes this expression. Okay? So if you take m to be 0 for a minute, this is a constant. This is the variational derivative of the energy with respect to lambda. The fact that you put in this topological charge says that you know, there is this curl lambda squared, so to say, that comes up in the evolution equation. So you might say, am I just doing this to fool around? I mean, make my life difficult, make a mathematician who might want to do this more difficult? Actually, no. Because why? Because you see, if you think about it, cracks, dislocations, the action, the fact that they move, it's always from the tip. Okay. The crack does not, action is all at the crack tip. So what this one is saying is that, see, these two parts, this multiplication says, you can have whatever energetic driving force wherever lambda is non-zero. It's going to do nothing to the evolution. The action will be only where there is a defect characterized by curl lambda. Okay? It's only there that you will incur dissipation. And this is important because, at least for me, because I'm interested in doing inertia dynamics too. So there are elastic waves going all around, right? You do a crack, elastic wave comes back, suddenly in the flank of the crack, it doesn't even care, right? If you don't have something like this, it's going to start evolving. Now you want to, you have to fiddle around, do something with the reversibility, this, that, and the other. This gets you. I mean, and uh, apart from the fact that I explained, action is all at the crack tip or the dislocation. It's not where the plastic distortion is. All right. That's, that's the model. And now we'll make this in, uh, even in pneumatics, you can do something uh, full around it. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about in the rest of my time is essentially this model over here. Uh, but but we, the idea is kind of general. Okay, so we've applied it to pneumatics uh, and to fracture in these papers. So okay, so so the Landau Dijon fan club here. Don't throw a fit that I'm doing something with a different model. Okay? Just it's it's in a way to look at to me. If I see Landau Dijon, it says nothing about solid elasticity. But clear, I mean, if Frank did something, Frank obviously knew dislocations. They wrote down the screw dislocation solution, look at, looked at that. Even in Dijon and Prost, you will see that that's how it is. So, so I want to see the analogies. That's important. Okay, so this is just with that theta model, but you allow the defects to move only in a layer. And so here, this is a, and, the, and there you do the full dynamics with the, with the curl lambda square hanging outside. So this is a, a minus one really, so two minus half started off very close. And this is the repulsion over here, so it's producing two minus halves. Okay. And they're going out, and it is a one over r interaction as, as they spread out. But you know, the theta, for the pneumatics with the theta, uh, from the mechanics point of view, it, it bothers you a little bit because you know, in the theory, uh, parametrization shouldn't really come up. So you, you can reformulate it in terms of the n vector itself. And this, so, so this part had the full dynamics. These two things are about just the, this is a gradient flow calculation from this energy, which I'll explain in a minute. So what is this picture over here? This is the field of the director for a loop, a half loop that's like this. Now, these arrows pointing here, it's hard to, you have to sit and understand. Let me just tell you what the, the local equilibrium comes out to be. This is the, over this edge of the loop. This is a minus half. This is a plus half on this edge. Here, there is a twist of opposite signs over here, okay? So, so here, you know, you start off with this, you make a circuit go back to the back of this particular loop. So, it starts off like this, it becomes like this, and when you go around, it will wind like that. So, the, these, these are twist disclination edges, if you will. And on these sides, it's wedges. And how do you play the game? The game is, uh, you have grad theta and lambda, so here, when you pose it in terms of tensors, 
what you do is you say the double well. So dub okay, so the energy, what are the pieces? This this penalizes the unit vector constraint. This guy is that drag k minus b business. B is like lambda here. This is the curve. And what is the double well? So what, what do you really want to do? If you want to flip the vector across a layer, suppose it's n, something here, should be minus n over there. So n minus minus n divided by the layer thickness, tensor it with a new. But for a pneumatic, the new has no significance, right? So could be any new. So, so if you look at uh, the norm of this, because then you don't penalize any particular direction. So that's going to be a two, that's why zero and two, you put that in. And uh, Likit, Kerek and Irene computed the relaxation of this particular energy that has been done. I don't want to steal their thunder, they are in the uh, audience here. If you want to know what the end result is of that relaxation, talk to them, okay? Uh, so that's that. So when you want to do fracture with this, the changes are going to be, see when you want to do fracture, this lambda will be the damage, but now it's vectorial. Gives you, so what it characterizes is the normal to the plane, the track plane, and the magnitude is the damage uh, uh, density, right? So uh, again, for the Griffith fan club, don't throw a fit. I like to use an energy where of this form, no surface energy. Because why? I mean, you know, to me, because <coughs> you put load and something cracks. I don't know. You know, bonds break. It's being dissipated. For me, it doesn't go into energy. Now, and Griffith was sufficiently vague about this. That's why when Irwin and company came, you know, it's the way, well, it's dissipation or what. So then you go mess around with the surface energy. Here, the energy has a meaning. So it's either stored energy or it's dissipated. So you don't store anything here, then you do the dynamics. And so, so the, here there's not going to be a grad theta minus a, a B or a lambda, why? Because you know, a dislocation even without loads, it produces stresses and energy, a crack won't. You don't put loads, crack doesn't do anything in terms of energy, okay? So, so here it's all in the modulus, you degrade the mod, Yes. Can I ask you. So I, I missed in, in which part of your constraints uh, you have concentration of this lambda variable or B variable. So in principle, this is a continuum yes. model in which lambda may be diffuse. Yes. So it is, it is, but the, it's this double well that does the concentration. I'll get to an example in a minute and, and we will see. Okay, so, so you have this. And this is a situation where you have a pre-strained fracture uh, block and you're moving out the fracture and, and you know, because it's pre-strained, there's a lot of energy, it can go supersonically. That's why you see the Mach cones over here. So let me just, in the my remaining time here, let me just talk about this particular model. Uh, so, so here it is. Uh, uh, okay, so think of this particular block. The displacement field, this is for the edge dislocations, okay? Edge dislocations can only move in this, this particular layer over here. U is defined everywhere over here. But this, uh, okay, this UP, this is an ansatz. Okay, it's a shear, shear strain. So alpha will be just, you take a derivative. The curl will come out like this. V is, it's the ansatz is that it can only be in the x, vary in the x direction and only in this layer. And this is a, this is a, 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 a an adapted measure for the stress, which works out for the thermodynamics, okay? So, so to your question now, the energy function is going to be, this is the elastic part, this is the curl, and this is the double well, okay? So, so how does it work? In the layer, you see, if you put phi up to phi bar over here, that part is happy. Zero is another well. This part is also happy. And the curl then get, gets you this particular core. Uh, that, that's what regularizes that bit. And, um, and that, that's why <coughs> localize there. 
And you, this is the dynamical model. I put this in, you equilibrate. I'll show you calculations now. Uh, and okay, so you do the thermodynamics and, and basically the velocity becomes of this form. So this was the current lambda to the power m. This is, you can choose m to be zero. The most natural choice is m is zero. Uh, yes, uh, m is zero, correct, right? So why did I put this in? The overall equations come out like this. Okay, rho u t t div of t, the stress. Phi t, this is in the layer. It's going to be, this is the, this is the y average stress in the layer, where is only in the x direction or x and y direction, but you average the y. And the inter by d phi, this is that non-convex potential and this is the regular energy. Okay. So if you were doing this uh, in the static case on an infinite domain, you could use a uh, convolution to write this part as a non-local guy only in phi. Okay. And so why did I put that m there? If you put m equals 2, this guy goes out. This is, shouldn't have called it Ginsberg Landau, it's Alan Kahn. m equals 1, this is going to be a level set equation. m equals 0 is the most natural one. I mean, you're not fiddling around with anything. So I call that non-local generalized Burger in hamilton jacobi form. Because take an x derivative of this, and if you shut, blink your eye and think this is a constant, that's burgers up to a half when m is equal to zero. And when m is not, uh, sorry, yeah, okay. And other, so, so that's why that. Um, but if you, when, when you go to the system form, it's not this reaction diffusion structure. It's actually a con. So phi i is the system. This is a very simplified bit of the system. This is a vector phi i t phi i x. And what's sitting in here, the speed for every component is really this x derivative of the energy which comes from psi and from the core energy. Okay. So, uh, okay, we do fairly careful calculations. So, this is, put in a dislocation, let it equilibrate. We pick out the fields. Okay. So, to your question, it does localize. And SLB, Frank, Navarro pileup. So, this is a double ended pileup. Those two dislocations are fixed. You start this guy off, uh, they equilibrate to the right positions. This is a very famous paper. Uh, they use Schrodinger's equation, the formula from there to get, come with the analytical solutions. This is a single-ended pileup. You load it, you know, this guy, it, oops, oops, oops. It goes, what did I do? Yeah, it goes there. Okay, I have really a little bit of time. And uh, finally, the, the, the a problem that's interesting is, uh, so, so suppose you have a Piers ask this question. I mean, Orwan put him on to this. Um, so the Piers problem is the following. Okay. So um, what uh, the question is, you know, everyone knows that uh, this location is not really singular. So one question was figure out the width, come up with the model uh, you know, width of the dislocation, which we do in our Piers in 1940. Okay. Thank you. And, and the second question was the following. So, so in the continuum setting, see, in plasticity, something like yielding happens, which means you know, put stresses, no plasticity, and only after a certain amount of stress does it is there plasticity. So it's, it's what is this analog at the dislocation level? The analog is this. And it was believed that you cannot do uh, pile stress in the continuum setting. Why? So due to some work with SLB, Peach and Keller, you can see that if you put some a load and there's a dislocation, there is a driving, it will want to make the dislocation move. So if, if under load, the dislocation has to stay fixed, there has to be something in the model that's actually putting in a reverse force that holds it together for a little bit. But the argument was the following, that okay, so what the, 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 the uh, files, the model he set up was elastic half space, linear elastic half spaces, and the joining bit is there's a non convex potential in the displacements of the top and the bottom. Okay? And then the question is in the continuum setting, then uh, 
If you believe that the driving force is like this derivative of this fellow with respect to the position of the center of the dislocation. So, dislocation right? so suppose you take a dislocation and you equilibrated it under no loads. The formalism here, the way Piers is thinking is you, you think of this guy as a completely rigid profile. Only degree of freedom is the coordinate of the center. And if the energy is translationally invariant, at least in the x direction, whether you put the guy here or there, no matter how nonlinear, the energy remains the same in an infinite medium. So there's not going to be any uh, resistive force. So consequently, you say that there cannot be, the conclusion was it cannot be. But what Pyers then Navarro in 1947, that's a paper that needs to be cleared up by some mathematicians looking carefully. You know, I've tried to, these things are hard to read, I mean, even for me. Uh, so it's not an easy paper. So there are many elements of the Pyers Navarro calculation, the 1947 paper, which are not so very clear. So, uh, so what the, 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 the fix was that you take lattice periodicity into account because then where your center coordinate of the dislocation is relative to the lattice planes matter and that gives you a resistive force because the energy changes. But you get very different magnitudes for the pile stress by that calculation. So what? So what did we do? In our case, first of all, it's a dynamical model and you do not say, you know, the, the, the slip profile, the phi profile is infinite dimensional, literally. I mean, you know, it could be changing shape. It's dynamical, so anyway, I'll finish up in like two minutes or three minutes here. So this is the unloaded profile at the base <coughs> of the dislocation. Okay, so dislocation is like that. This is unloaded. For the NGB case, the, 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 the most natural thing that comes from here with that phi x squared multiplication, you start putting loads, and we do as this is the part that you can't settle on a computer. We do very careful calculations, though I can describe to you what we did. And you put loads. The, the what I call the NGL, the Ginzburg-Landau, will not equilibrate will immediately. Go this fellow and the level set. See what happens is uh, up to loads like this, it changes shape. It does some evolution, but the dislocation changes shape and stays there. And then. When you get up to this sort of a limit, it pretty much, it doesn't change shape anymore and after that the dislocation moves. So, I will end here. I, um, I didn't get the chance to talk about the overall the finite demand deformation theory, but that's fine. I hopefully have conveyed the message. Good question here is, is, one question you can ask is, under load, are there equilibria for that equation with the phi x squared? A better question is, take the unloaded equilibria, start putting loads and answer the dynamical question whether actually this guy moves or not. And, and I can see if a mathematician got interested in this, you can go crazy, like you characterize all equilibria, blah, 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 everything. Right? So thank you very much for your attention.